The king is tired. See him to his chambers. Mr. Tywin Lannister of Casterly Rock, Westeros, is often seen by fans one of two ways, I think, so far as I understand. One is as an evil villain who caused the brutal murder of countless people as well as terrorizing his own children or they see him as a masterful badass who is the best character in the books slash show when i look at the psychology and behavior of this man though i don't think those two points entirely encapsulate him he was born into the hugely rich powerful and historic lannister family at a time where the house was dwindling due to his father titus Tywin was motivated to restore the Lannister name, and in a lot of ways he definitely achieves that. At the same time though, he's just as flawed, hypocritical, arguably even foolish a man as he is masterful. I think he's a pretty tragic figure when you consider the very same qualities that led to his rise are also probably what led to his and the likely downfall of Lannister as a whole. So yes, I am a counsellor, I've made quite a few videos analysing characters and their psychology and I thought it made sense to do some on A Song of Ice and Fire. Tyrion, Jaime and Cersei would all be fascinating characters to break down but I think if I'm ever going to do that we need to start by first understanding their father. So here we are, um, there are obviously a few differences between the show Tyrion and the book Tywin, however I think they mostly did a good job with the character, which means I'll draw on the show for examples here much more than I would with Tyrion for example, who is really very different in the show. And also, as always, feel free to add your thoughts in the comments, let me know if I miss anything important or get anything slightly wrong or whatever else, because you know, I think when there's a level of discussion in the comments is when things are at their best. Apart from that, let's just get going. It makes sense to begin with Lord Tywin's youth, for which we are given very limited information, but there is still some we can draw out as a general starting point to this video. The clearest thing we know is that Tywin's father, Lord Titus, was an amiable man, let's say. A man who sought to get on well with people, but was, in Tywin's words, weak as a leader. He was a good man, but a weak man. A weak man who nearly destroyed our house and name. Lords who had sworn allegiance to House Lannister mocked Titus to his face. They didn't pay their debts to him. He lacked the fortitude to rein them all in. Everybody laughed at Titus, essentially. And that seems to have been very humiliating to Tywin. This is his family being laughed at, you know? He no doubt grew up with his head filled with all the past wonders and greatness and stories he hears of House Lannister. And he looks from that to his father and sees the complete opposite and probably feels quite disappointed in his father, perhaps even ashamed. He could have been motivated instead to defend his father and feel angry on his behalf, but instead he seems more to be ashamed and embarrassed. And we'll get into that later, but I suppose generally this is a situation where the very thing he's supposed to be proud of, the, the highborn status, the legacy, the Lions of Lannister, is the very thing he's now being humiliated for. In that context, I suppose it's then unsurprising that Tywin grew to look on amiability, playfulness, perhaps even kindness, as weak qualities rather than ones that do have their place. Even in the harsh world of Westeros, they have their place. Titus was certainly not a good example for them though, a leader does need to be strong. This is the straightforward stuff about his character, but we need to start with this. Tywin is said to have distrusted laughter because of how it became associated to the idea of humiliation. A lot of the jokes and laughter he'd have heard growing up, or at least the ones he paid attention to, were at the expense of his proud family. And in a way, I guess that kind of sounds logical then. Perhaps he even consciously set out with the aim to make himself and House Lannister so feared that no one could possibly laugh at them ever again. If you see being mocked as your weakness, then being a person to fear would naturally be your armour. 
So when I look at this quest for power that Tywin is kind of driven by power, uh, you know, power can mean a lot of different things. It can mean wanting the freedom to do whatever you like. It can mean uh, wanting the power to influence certain figures, prove certain people wrong, maybe even out of a drive to get revenge. For Tywin, I think it's about two things. Well, probably others, but two I want to talk about. One is his obsession with people fearing him, not being able to humiliate him. We see Tywin go about in a very calculating manner, doing things that will specifically add to his fear factor. We can quite clearly see a correlation between what he suffered or felt to have suffered in childhood and what he's trying to avoid in adulthood. And the second thing I think is about control, although this is going to be a very specific point actually, so I might split it into a short chapter of its own. The Lannisters and their regards. You know, you can seek and gain power whilst giving the people that work for you a lot of independence and whilst seeking to grow the abilities of those around you as an extension of your own power. Or you can seek to utilise your enemies, manipulate and bend them into a position where they can serve your will, which in a lot of ways that kind of stuff is Littlefinger's approach to power and all of his talk about chaos. Tywin isn't that, I don't think, which doesn't mean he'll never do those things and won't see a crisis as an opportunity. This isn't a black and white point, but largely I think he seeks a to give those below him, or even above him, no real independence of their own. They've got to adhere to what he wants and how he insists on doing things, and B, to reach a place where he can totally annihilate his enemies. So let's look at both of those points in the example of the Reigns and the Tarbex, and how it also relates to Tywin's dad. I'll explain the story pretty simply in case you're not familiar. Obviously this is simplifying, but a lot of houses that owed allegiance to the Lannisters also had debts with Lord Tytos that they needed to repay, but wouldn't. <laughs> they could mostly get away with it, which, of course, a young Tywin then saw as part of this bigger insult and humiliation against his great and noble house Lannister. So, as such, Tywin went out and demanded forcefully that they pay them now, or if they aren't able to at the moment, then they give them a hostage to hold until they can pay. And some of the houses agreed to this, but Lord Rain of Castamere just laughed, and Lord Tarbeck decided to visit Tywin's father. You know, Tywin isn't in charge, he's still young at the time, better to speak to Titus himself, and be like, what's this about? You haven't seemed pressing with these debts before, why am I expected to pay them now? Can we have some kind of dialogue here? Only, Titus wasn't there when Lord Tarbeck went to visit, it was just Tywin there who arrested him, which is a pretty aggressive move really. And it resulted in the other Tarbex taking Tywin's cousins as hostages in response until Titus found out what had happened and was horrified. He exchanged their hostages back, he forgave the Tarbex and forgot the whole incident. Gone. Yeah, never mind. Which Tywin wasn't happy about, and that felt like backing down, so he demanded both Lord Tarbeck and Rain come to Castle Rock to answer for their crimes. But, you know, what crimes? Lord Titos is in charge, he'd just forgiven them for all of this, his son can't just say it's a crime when his dad is saying otherwise, that doesn't make sense. So naturally, both Rain and Tarbeck took this as an insult and they revoked their allegiance to the Lannisters, they'd had enough. At which point Tywin formed an army and he went and destroyed the Tarbecks wiped out their entire family and ruined their castle. Then when he couldn't get into Castamere where the rains are, he diverted a stream and blocked up the entrances so that the entire castle was flooded and everybody inside drowned. Hence the song detailing the event, the rains of Castamere. But now the rains we bore us home with no one there to hear. What's the point of me saying all this? Well, uh, point one I think is obvious. If Tywin gets the chance, he will completely and utterly destroy his enemies. Not just defeat them and take power, not just have them serve him, but wipe them out. Seen not just how it's done here, but also in the Red Wedding's treatment of the Starks, in going to war and burning up the Riverlands because Catelyn Stark had taken Tyrion prisoner for a crime she genuinely believed he committed, a crime Tywin didn't know they were going to try and execute him for, and a crime Tyrion miraculously freed himself from and walked home. And those examples, um, this isn't to say there aren't any logical reasons for Tywin to do these things, there definitely are reasons. 
but no one is ever 100% objective, you know. On a less conscious level, our decision making is always informed by our emotions, and if not our decision making, then our broader worldview which leads to us making certain decisions to begin with. You know, there are some logical arguments against what he does. Was going to war without first seeing what could be negotiated smart when it led partly to a war with a boy that consistently humiliated him in the beginning? Was the Red Wedding smart? In many ways, yes. In other ways, it would be very hard for the child of Sansa and Tyrion Lannister to rule over the North when the Lannisters have treated the North so brutally. Is that smart too? I don't know. There's definite arguments to say it is still smart to say those points don't factor, but even so, the point is this very clean, ordered side of Tyrion that wants absolutely no loose ends in anything. Enemies need removing like a weed. It all speaks of a man Tyrion describes early on as a man who doesn't believe in half measures. When Tywin noticed he was first going bald in the books, he immediately has all his hair shaved off because he doesn't believe in half measures. It's that same sort of no loose ends mindset, total, clean, absolute control over everything. Rather than a wild garden, for example, which may grow weird and wonderful things that could be utilised to your advantage, even if you're not sure yet how, Tywin instead prefers a blank, empty lawn where he can see across everything and have all parts exactly as he wants. I think that analogy works. Um, and there could be a lot of reasons for this behaviour that we just don't know from the books we aren't told or aren't told yet. Uh, we can say Tywin is narcissistic, Definitely. We can also look at this story about how he mistrusts laughter as a sign of humiliation and think he doesn't want to give other people the chance to humiliate him. If he has total control over everything, then there is no threat to humiliation. There are no surprises to be wary of, so remove all possible surprises. And obviously the point of wiping out enemies entirely is to show he's a force to be reckoned with, to make other people fearful of him, that's the larger point I've already discussed, the need for others to fear him as a defence against the mockery. But we can see this very ordered no loose ends kind of thinking in the way Charles Dance depicts Tywin, I think. All of his dialogue comes with this finality. Like every sentence finishes with this incredibly concluded kind of full stop, like that's conversation over, he's inviting and allowing no space for anyone to respond and even when he does ask for responses he often wants them very short or he's just wanting a response as part of a wider point he's trying to prove. Lannisters don't act like fools. It's bad manners to refuse a lord's offer. Jugglers and singers require applause. You're still fertile, you need to marry again and breed. You refuse to marry Loras to Cersei. I will name him to the king's guard. He will never marry. He will never have children. No. The Tyrell name will fade. I hope you see what I mean there, but there's this um, total finality to everything he says that makes him very much this cut everything cleanly, ordered kind of person, even in the way he talks. Because... Again, if you're wary of other people's opinions and speech and everything comes with this deeply ingrained fear of being humiliated or undermined, then you would have to make absolutely sure there is never any space for people to do that. So that was one thing I was saying about the Castamere story, cleanly removing all enemies. Order. Um, the other thing I mentioned was giving those below him or even above him no real independence. So let's get to that. We know Tywin doesn't treat his children that much like people to encourage and develop. Despite some complexity, they are mostly just tools or instruments to suit his own ends. He tells them what to do and they are just supposed to do it. And I know it's uh, socially expected to follow their father's orders, but even so, if we take the story of the Reigns and Tarbex, Tywin is not the Lord of Casterly Rock at the time. His father is in charge, but rather than accepting his leadership, Tywin deliberately sets out and does the complete opposite of what Titus wants. Titus did not press his subjects to pay his debts, yet Tywin very abruptly and forcefully demanded either payment or hostages. And then when this caused the dispute that Titus settled, Tywin went out again anyway and demanded they answer for their crimes, and when they didn't answer for them, which of course they weren't going to do, I doubt Tywin even expected they would, he went and destroyed them, completely the opposite of his father's wishes at 
every turn. You know, if anyone makes Tytos look weak in this story, it's actually Tywin himself. And I think, again, this tells us a lot about Tywin's obsession with being feared. Destroying House Rain and Tarbeck was never about paying debts, really. Despite a song being written about this whole event, and there being a popular saying about Lannisters paying their debts, which would be very obvious wordplay to use in the song, the song makes no mention of the debts or gold or any of that. All it sings about is a proud lord that threatens Tywin's own pride and authority and is therefore crushed. The whole event is about Tywin personally wanting to make himself look strong and formidable and someone to fear. He deliberately pushes two houses that were under his allegiance to a place where he had an excuse to completely destroy them all because it furthers the image he wants to craft for himself. So the story tells us that about Tywin, and it tells us that he deliberately wants to undermine those in positions of higher power than himself. Not follow his father's leads, not even try to work with it and discuss things as equals, but just completely go behind his father's back and very publicly make Titus look a bit stupid. And I think that's important because when I look at Tywin's life, it's what people said of Tywin in relation to the Mad King Aerys. Aerys was Tywin's friend in their youth, Tywin was supposed to be his hand, but people regularly joked that Tywin was really in charge of the kingdoms, not Aerys. <laughs> Which, you know, no doubt contributed to Aerys' paranoia and increasing dislike of Tywin. They went from friends to this very very tense rivalry where Aerys then refused to marry Cersei to Rhaegar and made Jaime his Kingsguard just so Tywin's heir couldn't inherit land. That's a massive blow to Tywin's ambitions and you know that's not mastermind genius on his part. All he had to do was be a good friend and counsellor to King Aerys, which admittedly would be hard on his descent into paranoia and madness, but do that and his daughter would get to marry the King's son while Jaime would inherit Tywin's lands. Only he couldn't help undermining Aerys, not to say that's all Tywin's doing, but still, it's probably a factor. I guess it just makes me wonder if Tywin has to be in charge of everything. And not even just discreetly in charge from the shadows, but publicly in charge in a way that people see. How stupid must Titus have looked after the Reigns and Tarbeck incident? It's all one massive message to say, I am nothing like my dad, he is weak, but I am very strong. And I would suspect that Tywin projected a lot of his own weak feelings onto Tytos. He is his son, after all. He will have grown up partly influenced by his dad. There will be traits and similarities between the two of them, some of which we'll discuss later. So if Tywin is similar to a weak and openly mocked man as far as he sees it, then Tywin will want to shut down that idea and distance himself from that. The best way he can do that is by projecting all the negative traits onto Tytos. So does that then become his typical response to those with higher power, even if they are his allies? To both project his own feelings of worthlessness onto them, but also to kind of create a proof, clear public evidence that he deserves their power in order to feed his ego. You know, if you do something that makes those in charge look a bit weak and makes himself look good, he can kind of then say, see, I deserve to be Lord of Castle Rock even now. I am very strong. Look how weak my dad is compared to me. Look how well I run King's Landing. This is me doing it, not Aerys, not Joffrey. I should be entitled to it. Does that mean he's directly trying to prove that to other people? No, I think he's trying to prove it to himself. And the best way he can get to prove that to himself is if it becomes public opinion that becomes external evidence to feed his ego, you know? It's kind of a point I made in my analysis of Nate Shelley from Ted Lasso, how do you spare yourself all the insecurities and difficult feelings that you can't bear to cope with? You project them onto someone else. In both these cases, project them onto people who have the thing you want, the thing you hope will feel you're lacking. Power. And then by projecting all your negativity onto them, you're also convincing yourself you not just want their power, but you deserve it. They're the ones with all the negative traits, I'm not. I would be way better in that role than they ever would. Therefore, it's not just that I want it, it's that I deserve it. I am entitled, it is my right. I think there is some small degree of that to Tywin. And people talk about him as this astute mastermind in the world of Westeros, and in some ways he is, I can't deny that. 
But in other ways, he is a man completely ruled by his own insecurities and ego, a man who cannot bear to be humiliated, who must do whatever he can to enhance his scary image, who will undermine and seek all his allies to submit to him and demand total ordered control. He can be very clever in how he goes about seeking these desires he has, but nonetheless he is always very adamant and obsessed with those goals. I think that makes him predictable in his own way. Even if he does go about the goals in unpredictable ways, it's still predictable what he's trying to do, I think. Um, and it's for that Rob Stark's plan was probably right when he suggested taking Casterly Rock, Tywin's home, attack his pride, prove to the world he can be humiliated, that he isn't quite so scary as he wants people to think. Let's talk a little more about humiliation though, because there's a lot further to take this point, especially when it relates to Tywin's feelings around sex. We all know Tywin is brutal in many situations, but sometimes it seems to go beyond that, I think, for which a good example is his treatment of Tysha. When Tyrion was young, he and his brother Jaime helped rescue a woman on the road named Tysha, which ended up in Tyrion getting to know and falling in love with her. She was lowborn, so the two of them secretly married and lived a few weeks of bliss until Tywin found out. He couldn't have his son married to a lowborn girl, socially it's not very acceptable, but even more so when Tywin has this fragile sense of pride. Um, he decided to get rid of Tysha and punish his son for marrying her, and he did it in a particularly cruel way. Force Jamie to lie to Tyrion that Tysha was actually just a whore. She never loved Tyrion, their rescue was all just staged and prepared for Tyrion to lose his virginity. And Tywin then had Tyrion stand and watch as his guards all took turns with Tysha before him after which he was forced to have sex with her again himself, only this time there was no love. A cruel and horribly traumatising experience. And also a very weird method to resort to, if you wanted to punish Tyrion, why choose that of all punishments? I just think there feels something quite voyeuristic about it, or maybe not voyeuristic, it's not actually clear if Tyrion watches this horror or not, but there's something he's getting out of it, it feels like. This kind of, I have so much control over you, Tyrion, that I can have countless guards rape your wife without me even having to exert any force, since there's nothing you can do about it. It's because we also have a story about Tywin publicly humiliating another woman. After Tywin's mum died, Tytos had a lowborn mistress who ended up in a position where she could order people about and wore his wife's old jewellery and things. Tywin didn't like this, so after his dad died, he had her stripped naked and marched through the streets. And then there's the story of Alayaya, the woman its first thought is Tyrion's whore in King's Landing. He has her tied to a post, whipped, then thrown out of the Red Keep, naked and injured. So that's three different stories we've got there, and at first I was thinking, okay, Tywin clearly has an interesting <laughs> relationship with women, which is probably true, although we know next to nothing about his wife or his mum, so it's hard to discuss. The thing that strikes me about these stories, though, is humiliating men through the women in his life. It's certainly no accident after Tyrion is sentenced to death that Tywin takes his whore Shay for himself. Is this all about wanting other people's women in order to exert or feel some sense of power over the men, a kind of cuckolding I suppose. At the very least, it's certainly a question worth asking. And considering that, I then see his treatment of his father's mistress in that light. So, sure that's different because Titus was dead at this point and Tywin, as far as we know, Tywin didn't have sex with her, although I wouldn't be surprised if he actually did. But stripping his father's mistress naked and marching her through the street, was that itself an act of I can do what I like with the person you cared for and there's nothing you can do about it anymore dad, I'm in charge now, kind of thing. And also there feels something incredibly Oedipal about that example. We know Tywin had a fair degree of rivalrous feelings towards his dad to an extent that he'd seek to humiliate him publicly. Was Tywin then jealous that his dad got this mistress? I don't know, maybe, maybe not, that's a bit much to speculate. And the punishment he gave her, this walk of atonement as it's called, is culturally a common one in Westeros, yes. 
but even so it's a religious one Tywin is not particularly religious there is also something kind of sexual and voyeuristic about the punishment itself which does make me wonder if doing this gave him some some of the pleasure he might have got out of the idea of having sex with his dad's mistress some of that pleasure while also getting pleasure from being able to feel above having sex with her at the same time i hope that makes sense you know presenting himself in a very righteous i wouldn't stoop so low to have sex with a low-born mistress that is vile behavior my dad was the lustful figure insulting his own wife projects that all into him whereas i am far better and more dignified getting to feel that stuff and express that while at the same time getting some degree but more voyeuristic sort of pleasure out of this act of shaming her. With a few exceptions, such as Tywin's wife Joanna, who we'll get to, this is all we see of his relationships with women. Using them like mere tools to get back at other men, to humiliate them, to feel power over them, get revenge for the ways they may have threatened his ego. Perhaps in that context it's not too surprising he often kind of ignores and overlooks Cersei, I think that's a stretch to say because his relationship with her is complicated, but I'm chucking that out there anyway. I suppose I'm saying generally there is something quite interesting here that I haven't fully pinned down. We know his mother died at some point growing up, we don't know exactly what effects that had on him or what he felt about it, that would be interesting to find out, but let's talk about his sons now. I think another part of what makes Tywin and Tyrion's relationship so interesting is how incredibly similar they both are. And part of their shared arc is Tywin consistently saying that Tyrion isn't his son until Tyrion tells him at the end, I am you writ small. Everything Tywin accuses Tyrion of being is basically a reflection of himself. You are an ill-made, spiteful little creature, full of envy, lust and low cunning. You know. Low cunning is probably Tywin's greatest strength, but we've talked about projection already, Tywin projecting all his negative feelings onto his father in favour of what he'd have heard and read in the history of the Lannisters, and then his father dies and drifts out of focus. All attention is on Tywin now, so where else can he project to now? He is born with a dwarf son who he is ashamed of, a son who possesses low cunning and can be spiteful and very lustful. A son whose very existence gives people an opportunity to mock Tywin again, and so everything now gets projected onto him. Projecting there even though, and I suppose partly because, they are exactly the same, right down to Tywin's constant criticisms of Tyrion's whole ring, because as we saw, Tywin took Tyrion's own whore Shay into his bed, he also gave her his gold chain of office to wear, just as Titus had previously given his own mistress his wife's jewellery. Tywin isn't so different of either of them as he tries to appear, and in Book 2, Varys leads Tyrion on a secretly built passage from the Tower of the Hand to the nearby brothel. One Varys says was specifically built for another king's hand, whose honour would not allow him to enter such a house openly. We also see that the window there is patterned with red and yellow, the Lannister colours. So whilst only a theory, and it's one George R. R. Martin has been careful to avoid confirming or denying. It does seem fairly plausible that Tywin had this passage built when he was Hand of the King, that he had regularly been visiting the brothel despite his outward disdain for it. Or rather, not despite his outward disdain. Because that disdain itself is probably born directly out of his own sexual urges and how they contradict with the dutiful, proud figure he aspires to be, Tywin needs to disdain and project it all onto Tyrion in order to excuse himself of the exact same qualities. Because what do you do when you can't forgive yourself for your flaws? You either punish yourself for them, or you punish someone else you can project them onto. Or possibly both. It's interesting, however, to see where Jamie comes into all of this, because I've speculated, and it is all speculation, it's worth reminding you that, that Tywin wants to be the exact opposite of his dad, and he probably grew up with all these stories about his noble line of great and dignified Lannisters, and in some way he probably developed an image there he could aspire to be, which is what he wants Jamie to become. Splitting is very much at work in how Tywin views his two sons, Tyrion is the bad one to project all the negative traits onto, Jaime is the good son to see positively, or at least he's supposed to be the good son. 
You know, to some extent, Jamie is exactly the sort of figure you'd read about in old stories of the Lannister house. He's a brilliant fighter, brave, good looking, tactically smart when it comes to the battles themselves. Not a person you'd want to come up against, and he doesn't go drinking and whoring. He does sleep with his sister, admittedly, but Tywin remains willfully blind to that fact. So in that sense, these are all esteemed qualities that Tywin himself wants to be known for, the image he tirelessly tries to build for himself, except A, he's getting old, his head needs shaving, he can't truly be remembered unless his dynasty carries on beyond him through an heir, and B, he knows he isn't quite the esteemed figure he wants to be because he is devious. I'd even argue spiteful, you know, he's restrained enough to take revenge possibly years down the line in a very calculating manner, but he's still spiteful. Deep down, I don't think he ever lives up to the aspirations he has for himself. Deep down, I think he knows that. I suspect he not just projects the bad feelings onto Tyrion as a result, but he also projects all of his desperate hopes onto Jaime. No wonder Tywin is so obsessed with legacy, living vicariously through his son. He can be the person I always wanted to be. Except Jamie isn't that either. Jamie knows his stuff when it comes to a battle, but he's not politically astute. He's not really a leader in many ways either. Jamie is a bit directionless. He's not dignified because he's the Kingslayer. He gets captured in a battle where Tywin never did. He's quite empathetic, I would say, and he then even loses his hand. Tywin, I think, is disappointed in Jamie, but in a different way to how he's disappointed in Tyrion, because Tyrion's not expected to amount to anything, he's just a spiteful little creature as Tywin words it. Jaime has potential, Tywin is desperate for Jaime to represent all of his own ambitions. I need you to become the man you were always meant to be. Not next year, not tomorrow. And Jaime never does. Jaime's not really meant to either, he's meant to be his own man, I think that's kind of the direction his storyline is heading in. Tywin likewise was meant to come to terms with who he is, his true identity, not his forced, somewhat contradictory image of someone terrifying and badass, yet also someone of great dignity and honour. Perhaps the greatest tragedy is the fact Tywin never does come to terms with this. Both the good and the bad. Um, as a result, his children are never truly seen, not as individual human beings, not as who they truly are, just as what they symbolise to him. And in the absence of a mother to potentially give them what they need, that no doubt had a catastrophic effect on all three children. Tywin married his cousin Joanna Lannister. Is that similar to the incest between Jaime and Cersei? I don't know, I guess Cousins was a lot more acceptable. Um, anyway, it was said Tywin smiled on that day and that she was known to be one of the few people to ever make him laugh. By all accounts, Tywin seemed to genuinely love her. It would of course be very interesting to learn more about their relationship because it reveals a less guarded, armoured, domineering side to Tywin. A side he doesn't really show to anyone else at any point. Laughter and joking are serious threats to his ego, but not when it's Joanna. So then I thought about the scenes in the show that Tywin shares with Arya, and those scenes are not in the books, we definitely have to keep that in mind, but all the same, they're interesting. Tywin appears to hold a great respect for this mysterious, probably highborn but pretending to be lowborn cup bearer he has. Is that just because she's incredibly smart for her age, or is it also actually because she challenges Tywin? Have you ever lost before? I can't say I've ever met a literate stonemason. Have you met many stonemasons, my lord? Tywin finds it as much amusing as anything else, not a real threat. Probably because Arya is both a woman and also just a cup bearer that he only has these conversations with in private. You know, she can't make him look foolish in front of other people and she herself isn't a threat to his position the way Tywin might see a man as being. Which is also strikingly different to his children who don't challenge him. At best, Tyrion just tends to goad him and they spend their time trying to win his approval. Arya challenges him rather than seeking approval, although her motives are much more complex than that, but as a result she does win his approval, 
I guess I'm just vaguely wondering if Joanna also challenged Tywin, though probably in more the way a lover both challenges and supports you than in the way Arya does it. It would be safe for Joanna to challenge him because she is no threat, she's his wife, a lot of it will be done privately between the two of them. And then she died. We don't know enough to know much about how this affected Tywin, but he clearly still grieves her to the extent... I don't think he ever even says her name, as far as I'm aware, it's too painful. You who killed your mother to come into the world? Joanna was perhaps the best thing for Tywin, if I am right about her. Someone who could challenge him, and maybe even mock him without it being dangerous, but actually affectionate. Someone who could teach him he doesn't always need his armour up so tight, someone who could look at the real Tywin, not the facade he's constructing, and love and respect him for that. Someone to offer him something much deeper than just filling the ego. In Tyrion's case, of course, he was blamed for Joanna's death because she died giving birth to him, further fueling Tywin's disdain for him and reasoning to see him like some evil devilish creature rather than a human being. Tyrion's very existence is a painful reminder of Joanna's death, for which, on the one hand, he might not even want to think about Tyrion, but on the other hand, Tyrion is still also a part of Joanna, a part of her memory, a part of the person he loved. Until sentencing Tyrion to die for the murder of Joffrey, there have been several quite weak attempts, I would say, by Tywin to get Tyrion killed. For which I wonder if Tywin has always been in conflict about it, half wanting to kill his son, but also struggling because he can't, he can't kill or get rid of a part of the person he loved. Tyrion, in a metaphorical sense, I think, in part, represents who Tyrion really is. A clear, physical, visible reflection of himself. I think learning to accept and care for Tyrion would represent Tywin learning to both accept himself, and also to probably finally let go and healthily mourn the loss of his wife. Instead, he ends up trying to kill Tyrion, in many ways trying to kill a part of himself which actually then seals his own doom. If, and it is an if, Tywin did build that secret tunnel to the brothel, then I suspect it would have been built after Joanna's death. I suspect he started to realise something that his father probably felt with his mistress. He sought her out not as an insult to his wife, but precisely because he missed his wife's company, and wanted something to fill that space. No wonder, in that sense, Titus wanted his mistress to wear his wife's jewellery. So I just wonder if the same thing happened with Tywin. He wasn't just seeking out a mistress for sex, he was letting Shay wear his gold chain, and knowing her character, she probably challenged him a bit, and would be company. Perhaps Tywin used to let his wife Joanna wear his gold chain, and that's why he's now giving it to Shay. Maybe? Did he let all the women he sleeps with wear the chain? It's possible. Either way, there's definitely a ton of conflicted feelings around sex for Tywin. There's the base desire, then there's feeling undignified and dishonourable for having base desires, and how he used to criticise his father for that, then there's missing the affection of his wife, which must have been particularly hard for Tywin. This is a man who opened up to absolutely no one except his wife. No one at all. Then there's the side of sex that is an insult to his wife, then in the case of Shade there's also the part of it that's humiliating his son and relishing in the private delight of secretly doing that, and it all makes for a lot of complexity. One of my favourite Tywin scenes is his first one with Jaime Lannister. There's so much in it you could do a whole scene analysis on, but I want to draw attention to this exchange. You spend too much time worrying about what other people think of you. I could care less what anyone thinks of me. You know, that's what you want people to think of you. Everything Tywin says there is also a reflection of himself. He wants people to think he's strong and terrifying and dignified and that... The lion doesn't concern himself with the opinions of a sheep. That he's too big to possibly care what people think of him. And yet his every action is always driven by what makes him or what makes his house look good or a house to be feared. In many situations, yes, that is a sensible, logical thing to do, but that doesn't mean it isn't also a very personal, emotional drive for him. 
You know, how Stark didn't logically need to be feared under Eddard or anything, did it? There's a story Tyrion recounts of a fool who once joked that Tywin Lannister is so rich that he shits gold, to which some say the man is still alive deep in the dungeons of Casterly Rock. If that doesn't paint a picture of personal, cold yet burning rage for what others think of him, then I don't know what does. If kind of having his own theme song, The Reigns of Castamere, his <laughs> wrestler entrance music, and sending an envoy to Faircastle to play it as a threat, if that doesn't show that he cares what other people think of him, you know? Tywin is a very calculating, logical man, but that doesn't mean he isn't also a man 100% driven by his ego, and in many ways it's his ego that gets him into trouble. The great irony that a man who forever is talking about family has absolutely no awareness or understanding of his children. He more or less sees them just as cogs, not people in their own right so much as extensions of himself. He talks about legacy not truly for legacy's sake, but for his image of himself to live on. In a literal sense, his downfall is the result of refusing to ever recognise Tyrion as his son. Tyrion shoots him with that crossbow for a ton of different reasons, I suppose, because his father never considered him a son but wanted him dead, because his ego led him to deliberately steal Shay for himself, which itself is an interesting point, you know, all the rivalrous feelings Tywin may have had with his own father, he's now playing out the exact same game with his own son. I suspect the very fact he felt driven to kind of cuckold Tyrion shows that deep down he understood Tyrion had great strengths to the extent he felt threatened by them. Anyway, that was a part of what provoked Tyrion to shoot him, there was also the whole Tysha story. It's not in the show, but Jaime confesses to Tyrion after freeing him that Tysha he married all those years ago, that Tywin has humiliated before Tyrion's eyes, that she wasn't actually a whore and did genuinely love Tyrion. The cruelty of this is what leads him after Tywin, which again is a direct result of Tywin finding pleasure in so brutally humiliating his son and obviously how traumatic that is for Taisha too. And then there's how little Tywin understands his son, not just a continued insistence that Tyrion is no son of his, but also Tywin refers to Taisha in the books or Shay in the show as a whore. Tyrion warns him not to use that word. Both Taisha or Shay meant a great deal to Tyrion. He loves or loved them and Tywin dismisses this. Which in part could be hypocritical, but where he's trying to skillfully persuade Tyrion to put down the crossbow, something he kind of almost achieves, he fails to understand exactly how much Tysha or Shay means to Tyrion, so he uses the word whore again, and he is shot for it. Tywin's downfall, however, is also the downfall of the Lannister legacy. Without Ned Stark, House Stark still amounts to a great deal, because Rob is a capable leader, Sansa is naive to begin with but very intelligent, so is Arya, Bran is the Free-Eyed Raven, Jon Snow is a bastard but a skilled leader, Rickon is there. <laughs> um, all of them consider the other close family and would support each other. And also, much of the North holds House Stark in high regard and feels a great sense of loyalty towards them, the North remembers. House Lannister without Tywin though is nothing like that. His children are to an extent very intelligent, capable leaders, however Sansa is hindered by the worst of her father's spites, in a way so is Tyrion. Jaime lacks direction at least initially, although I think his character arc provides space for something better there. All of them are caught in rivalry and could easily end up fighting against each other. And no one anywhere in Westeros except, like, Maester Pycelle feels any loyalty towards the Lannisters because all they ever felt was fear towards Tywin. This is perhaps where his treatment of the Reigns and Tarbeck starts to become a negative because without the fear for Lannisters, who actually wants to support them? Who wouldn't double cross them given the chance? All siblings have a level of rivalry for their parents' affections or approval at some stage growing up. Ideally, it's a rivalry that can be worked through, however, when their father is so cold and disapproving as Tywin is, who does not regard or merit them for who they actually are, and when there's no other parental figure to treat them any better, that no doubt magnifies the sibling rivalry massively. 
their fights and hatred for each other, even between Cersei and Jaime in a way, although that's a very complicated point for another day, um, become huge feelings that might end up destroying all of them. So without Tywin in that sense, the Lannister house seems doomed to implode. Tyrion has gone off seeking Daenerys where he likely fights against the Lannisters directly, and Cersei may very well just destroy herself in the books. Everything that drove Tywin to his greatest heights is also everything that seals his doom. Is he the badass masterful champion of Westeros? No. He wants you to think he is. Really, he's a flawed, quite hurt man who learns the hard way that really power for personal sake amounts to little more than feeding an unquenchable ego until eventually it kills you. Tywin's story is the tragedy of a man completely unable to accept anything about himself. So there is something quite tragic in that way. He's a fascinating character whose depth only lurks in the shadows of the story, I think. I've tried my best to draw out as much as I can see, but please let me know what I've missed or interpreted wrong. I'm not a big book nerd for A Song of Ice and Fire. I've only been reading them recently, in fact, and only watched the show recently too, so I'd hope there's some more that some of you can add in terms of insight. If you liked this though, please like the video, subscribe if you want to see me analyse other characters, support me on Patreon if you want to help keep the channel going, but otherwise, hopefully see you next time. And as ever, a special thank you goes to Janice McMahon, Luke Corr, Chichu Kaber, Michael Gallagher, InSquares, Samara Salsi, Joshua C. Follier and Chad Bramwell. Thank you.